my hands here. <laughs> I got to put my smiling face on. <laughs> Welcome to small. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to small town big deal. I'm Rodney Miller, and, <laughs> and I'm Jan Carl. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Sound of Truth. This is episode number three, and Rodney Miller is in the house with us. We have a special studio guest, Rodney Miller, creator and co-host of Small Town Big Deal. Let me tell you, if you don't know Rodney already, let me give you a little introduction. Rodney is the creator and co-host of the hit television show Small Town Big Deal on the of the RFD channel, but also has been in national syndication since 2015, is on well over 200 and what 48 50 270 stations 270 stations across this great nation uh prior to his venture into television rodney was an, an executive in the tractor industry and served as ceo of a couple tractor companies he's a farm boy who grew up in franklin county illinois a great place to grow up i hear there's some nice people from there some people <laughs> decent people come out of franklin county i don't know Illinois. Any of them, but. he is a fellow graduate of benton high school just a few years before me benton consolidated high school <laughs> vchs uh, rodney's been married to kendra for 42 years they have three grown children and as of just a couple weeks ago seven grandchildren most importantly rodney rodney is a follower of jesus christ and his faith impacts all of his life including the vision of Small Town Big Deal. And I'm grateful to call him my friend. Rodney, welcome to the show. We're glad you're here. Hey, I'm glad to be here. I mean, I've been watching you and Rick, so I'm like, i got to be on that. got to be on that podcast. I mean, <laughs> you just got to be there. Oh, well, we're, <laughs> we're very excited to have you. Very excited to have you on here. We're going to talk about the Word of God here in a little bit, Genesis chapters uh, 21 through 30, and then we're going to interview Rodney about his venture into television and how God's blessed that. So it's going to be a great show. Hope you hang around. Hey, in here, you know, a farm boy like me. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking about that. <laughs> so, have you ever been to a tractor pull? Oh, many tractor <laughs> pulls. <laughs> I've participated in many tractor pulls, right. and I'm going to be in a tractor pull here in Florida in just a couple of weeks, February really? 7th, I think. Where at? In Leesburg. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I'm going to be a featured speaker there, too. So, you have to come down and Wow. I'll charge you 50 bucks to listen to me, but of course it's free for everybody else, but nice. you guys can pay 50 bucks. Oh, <laughs> sounds like a deal. Yeah, now, sorry. for the uninitiated, what is a tractor pull? <laughs> so, we see who's got the most powerful tractor by seeing how much you can pull this weight down the track. But as, the further you go down, the weight goes up on this thing, and it gets harder and harder to pull. And then when you get real close to the end, some scar, scar fires, they call them, go down in the ground, which really make it... They can stop you in a dime if they want you to, what they want to. No that sounds really cool. Yeah. That it's a competition. Really cool. Yeah. I it's thought it was just fun. competitive. The way that you... It, so, so for someone who doesn't know, I thought it was just a parade of tractors and people are on the back. It's like, oh, it's cool. a tractor ride. That yeah. sounds way cooler. Like, I'm no, way interested in that. It, it, it is a lot of fun. Well, it, it is to me. Maybe it would be... It, most people would like to see it because there's a lot of black smoke and lots of loud engines. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we filmed something really unique a couple of years ago at the Klotzki Festival in Minnesota, which is... Do you know what Klotzki is? Mm -mm. So that's a Czech food, and that's a Czech celebration. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's really good. It's a pastry type thing. And we made some, and oh, they were really good. But anyway... One thing they had there is they had a tractor pull, mm -hmm. but it was a tractor pull. Four people, you, you have oh, teams of four, <laughs> and they pulled a tractor. <laughs> and Jan and I even did it. It was it was a hoot. Yeah. You know, that's unique. Yes. That's the things we look for that are unique in our show. Uh, right. Why can you, what, everybody's got a parade. What do you got that's different? That's different. Yes. Wow. Interesting. All kinds See, of stuff. Tractor, there. There's all different kinds of tractor pulls out there. I'm that's glad right. I asked. Yeah. yeah. People in Minnesota are saying, oh, a tractor pull. You're just... <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, all right. Well, let's get to the Word of God. Genesis chapter 21 through right. 30 was the assignment for those who are following along and reading through the Bible in three years with our uh, Sound of Truth Bible reading plan, which we have made available online. If you go to soundoftruth.org, you should be able to find that. You can print that out. And... Uh, if you go along with us, you'll read through the whole Bible in three years. If, the, if you've never read through the whole Bible, that's something we highly, highly encourage is to read through the whole Word of God. God only wrote one book, so it's worth reading. And we are in week number three, which this is episode three, 21 through 30. So as we do here, as we've done before, Rick, we'll start with you. What did you get out of this and anything stand out to you from Genesis chapters 21 
through 30. All right, I'll just start out with one because there's a lot happening in these chapters here, so we'll give everybody freedom of stuff to bring up. The one I always, I love to get more information on. You know mm -hmm. how like, sometimes you'll be reading and you get like a paragraph, and then really it's like God gives you the rest of, the, like you have to fill in the story yourself. The story in, it's chapter, two, it's Genesis chapter 25, and the only note that I wrote down here regarding it is, what was up with the soup, the birthright, and Esau? <laughs> Esau, he despised his birthright so much so that he was willing to give it up for a bowl of soup. Must be good soup. That, and that's, what the, that's the first <laughs> joke that Joe always makes, like, man, that soup must have been something. And, but he also talks about, like, man, if I, if I don't have this bowl of soup, I'm going to die anyways. So I think he's, he makes some comment about that. So I, I guess I'm always, in my own imagination, I'm like, okay, how much of this is him exaggerating? How much of this is the actual truth? And was he just so lazy or thought so little of his birthright? He was like, oh, that doesn't matter. I'm, mm -hmm. You're not really going to, and maybe it wasn't true. Con in his high, mind, it wasn't a true contract. Like, I'm just saying this to my brother. Yeah. He's not really going to call, call me and say, you gave me a birthright over a bowl of soup. Who knows? But that story just always makes me stop and think, like, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. That it is. It's it's used. I mean, I've heard it used in sermons and stuff as an example of uh, going for immediate pleasure over long term. What's best for you? Right. Right. Which is which is a struggle for all of us, all the way down to the daily disciplines of: Am I going to go to the gym this morning, or am I going to enjoy a Krispy Kreme donut? Right. Krispy Kreme. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's not a choice. <laughs> but, like, wait, what do you mean? <laughs> but the ramifications of this particular story are are much more. So uh, this stew must have been pretty amazing, like you say. This this bowl of soup. In fact, it'd be interesting to have a commercial, right? It'd be something if uh, it was an Allstate that came out with the Mayhem commercial a few years ago, where they're showing yeah. the history of the world. It's mm -hmm. very theologically correct that. The depravity yeah. of man has ruined so much through the world. And I think they even had a biblical reference in there or two. I could see maybe Campbell's or somebody doing a soup thing here with, you know, you'd sell your birthright for it's a bowl good. of soup. <laughs> yeah. What would you do for a lentil soup? <laughs> What's really interesting, though, is Jacob, verse 31, uh, he's the one that comes up with the idea. Almost like he was waiting. He's waiting like for he's an opportunity to get that birthright. birthright. It's pretty sneaky. Yes. So... Why? I mean, it is strange, and I, I don't know. If, I, I don't know if I have the answers for you on that. Well, I, I don't think we. It's not there in the scripture, right? right? I so mean, that I, that's why I get to have fun in my own brain, trying to be like, if I were having to shoot this mm -hmm. and make a show of it, I wouldn't just do these verses. I'd have to fill in, you know, the flavor. And it's like, now what's the flavor? What do I get to do? And that, I'm curious about what if you guys had ever thought about it. Made yeah, well, up your own little well background. if your brother was dying, he was so hungry, would you not just give him some soup? I mean, you know. That's where the sibling rivalry is so That's great. where yeah. the the quality of Jacob, you know, this mm -hmm. whole time, I, in the, a lot of the this whole uh, series of, of chapters, I'm trying to figure out, if, and through my life, I've weighed this, is Jacob a good guy or a bad guy? Yes. I'm not totally sure what mm -hmm. he was. And um, um, even when he, of course, you know, I love the story of um, um, Leah and Rachel. Right. I mean, talk about some trickery. Uh, yeah. This Rachel must have been a looker. I can tell you that for sure. But he mm -hmm. works for seven years for Rachel. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, it, and, and it then he gets tricked. Just a few days. It's a good point for not get it, not drinking in your life because he gets drunk and <laughs> right, and he gets tricked and he wakes up with Leah and he has to work seven more years for Rachel. Mm -hmm. So he works fourteen years for her. Right. Would you have worked fourteen years for Lacey? Oh, I'd there's work only, a lifetime for her. There you, uh, there's only one right answer to that question. <laughs> Cue that up and let me hit it. <laughs> so, yeah, Jacob. And, and, and here we are with Jacob again in, in Genesis 25. He's a conniver and a schemer, but then Laban was obviously scheming on him. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, man. Laban is like the, your prototypical villain in this whole thing. Just, he really is. You, there's no doubt. Good guy, bad guy. This guy's a bad guy. He's just, but the name Jacob means deceiver, so he's being deceived. The deceiver's being deceived by Laban. Laban had observed him enough to know I can get this guy drunk and fool him. So, going back to your point about, you know, you you and I both share a conviction that the wisest thing is no alcohol at all. Um, you know, I, I'm sure 
that's not the case for most Christians today. Most Christians today say, hey, a little bit is okay. And I can't exactly biblically uh, prove that they're wrong on that, although I think a pretty strong case would be made for it. But uh, but he he observed him enough to know, I can get this guy drunk on his wedding night and fool him and give him my other daughter. And he did it. So Don't was, drink, kids, or you might end up with the wrong <laughs> wife. <laughs> Just there you go. It was for this passage that there was no alcohol at my wedding because i did not want to marry the wrong woman <laughs> i'm just kidding <laughs> no no at his wedding they had a, a pig <laughs> that's right we've talked i think we've talked about we've it already, on, we on the that. show but yes we had your exactly as you would expect in the tv or in the cartoons pig splayed out on the table pi- apple i almost said pickle apple in the mouth <laughs> For real, that's that's part different. Of Filipino culture. I've never seen that before. Yeah, you gotta get yourself into some <laughs> Filipino weddings, and you'll see it. Receptions, that is. <laughs> it was pretty cool. We go from the church down the hallway, go go from the sanctuary down the hallway into the fellowship hall, and there's a, and we go to the line. And there's a big old dead pig laid out. And they're cutting out of the pig and putting it on your plate right there. <laughs> It's pretty cool. Yeah, uh, in the Philippines, it's getting too much no, coverage on our yeah. yeah in podcast, the Philippines, but. there's no confusion about where the, your meat comes from. <laughs> you don't look at this, is this chicken or cow or oh no, it's it's pig. You can see it's right over there. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> so Esau sells his birthright to Jacob. There's bad blood between the, these oh, brothers. Yeah. I'm an only child. I don't know what this is like so much. I don't know if you any of your brothers tangled a lot or what. Oh yeah. See yeah. <laughs> they, that he even has to ask the questions. Like, I don't know if you guys ever fought. <laughs> Right. You fight. Only every day. <laughs> okay. Oh, Even yeah. on the farm, we got all that land growing up on oh, the farm. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I had two older brothers. There was five years between two groups, but, you know, so I didn't fight as much. Oh, well, of course, the oldest brother, he, he was always trying to be dad and tell us, still today, to this day, is trying to do that. But then my, I had a brother at 13 months from me that we fought a lot. We we're very competitive. Wow. And, uh-huh. and, uh, uh, not so much now. We we get along really good. Uh, Your I mean, younger younger brother? Yeah. Thirteen months. Thirteen months. My little brother was born the day before my first birthday, so I was birthday. I wasn't even the baby of the family for a full year. Wow. Before he came in and ruined it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he and I got into it a lot. So. Yeah, and we like, all have great relationships. Yeah, of course. We did a we did we did our share of fighting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Even some knockdown drag out fights. So you guys, when you read this section of scripture and you see this weaving through these chapters, this sibling rivalry oh, yeah. that is way out of hand, you can identify and in, in a way I I can't, obviously. But um not to that extent. I, yeah, right. I would say I'm thankful that it wasn't, you know, dad loves this guy more and mom yeah. loves this guy more. Like there yeah. was none of that for us. And That's even very with, unhealthy. with the, you know, the 12 brothers, with, with um, Joseph, with is Joseph and the multicolored, is, am I getting all, I get yeah. all the patriarchs mixed up. Uh, you're right. Um, it, and yeah, and there, there's not been any favoritism to that extent, mm-hmm. right? Um, I, actually, I don't know if there's been ever any favorite. We always joke around he, that the parents love the youngest one. That, that's, I think that's kind of <laughs> the given. But yes, mm-hmm. I'm grateful that there's not that kind of favoritism among us, but in terms of sibling, sibling rivalry... Oh yeah, you're gonna. Especially, I would imagine it's even worse with the brothers because that's that is gonna go to blows. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we did. And I love you, bro. Yeah. <laughs> and yet, you see a lot of that in the Bible. I mean, you know, just like you said, Jacob then loved Joseph more than the others, and and Jacob's mom loved Jacob more than Esau. And mm-hmm. I mean, I don't see that in regular life that much, but seen a lot. And I think it's happened to other places, but I, my memory's not jumping to yeah, it. Yeah, right it seems like second. culturally it must have been acceptable. Yeah. Yeah, which is, I think, our culture, I think that'd be frowned upon. You're like, wait, what are you talking yeah. about? Yeah. I'm not sure the word of God really puts favor on that. I, I think, yeah. obviously, we'd, we'd aspire to something greater as parents. Show me more. Let's talk a little more about your story here with, with you mentioned Rachel and, and Leah. Mm-hmm. That, that jumped out at you. Yeah, I mean, I was, as a, Especially when I was uh, younger and, and, you know, when I was dating and, and, and that type of thing, that story really jumps out at you, you know. Right. And uh, uh, I don't think on it quite as much anymore, but, but I just thought, what a, that's a, what a concept, having to work seven years for a wife mm. and, then, and then get tricked. 
I mean, and and then has to work another seven years, and and he does it, right? You, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, but yeah, that that story is, and then Rachel, who she kind of turned out to be, and kind of who Leah turned out to be, and uh, you don't yeah. always understand all of that, you know. Obviously, um, you know why. You know, like Joseph, you were. T- I mean, uh, Jacob, you were saying that really he was kind of chosen by God when he wasn't such a good guy, uh, right? You know, a lot of people think that he really came to uh, salvation late in his life. I don't know if that's true or not. I mean, we can all interpret that how we want, but but why did God choose him? He was a pretty jerky guy. I mean, right. well, I think this goes back to what you were saying earlier. He's is he a good guy, or bad guy? God doesn't choose like all any, of us. I was gonna say, ultimately, <laughs> yes. God doesn't choose name, any good people. Name that's one right. good person He has chosen, right? Right. right. No, no, Jesus is exactly. it exactly? Yeah. yeah, Jesus. We remember when Jesus talked about um, when someone said, "Call him good teacher." Why do you why call, do you call, me, call good? me good? Exactly. That's why I was thinking the same thing. Well, he was we trying to elicit we don't even to him. understand goodness. He, he right? of course, Jesus was a master of the Socratic, what we call the Socratic method, the Jesus using method. the questions. Right? Really? Isn't that funny? <laughs> Jesus was learning. Yeah. So he was trying to draw out and get him to think about what he was saying. God alone is good, Jesus said. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So true. Yeah. Of course, yeah. he is God in the flesh. Right. If, if so, you can read between the lines, that's what he's saying. I, I know what good is. Only God is good. I know that because I'm good. I'm God. Right. But, yeah. The guy couldn't see that yet, though. Exactly. He didn't and, have the eyes to see And some of that. us are just better at hiding our faults. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Some people, are, they're more out in the open. Exactly. But, you know, the one person in the Bible, that, you know, we talk about all these patriarchs and all their faults, and, they all, you know, David was, God said, a man after his own heart, yet look at all the oh, wrongs yeah. David did. And uh, so, but, you know, so I think that's hope for all of us. Um, but the one guy that really I've always thought didn't really have that negative thing against him was Joseph. And then Daniel maybe as well. Yeah, Daniel too. Yeah. Maybe Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but they weren't as big a characters, right? A, right. As Joseph as is Joseph. a patriarch. Joseph right. is a patriarch, and he really never had that failure in With, his life. But like you were saying just a minute ago, he he hit it better. But he he was pretty brash at what seventeen years old, telling his brothers about he his dream. There was yeah. arrogance. I don't know if that's that was, sin, but so it's I, certainly it, it wasn't wise. That, you could <laughs> read that wise. as brash. You could read it as arrogant, or he just naive. Right, he just right. like I'm. Probably just, naive. I love you yeah, guys. guys this is this my dream. my my circle of trust. I can share with you guys, and he just didn't see like they hate his guts. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And of course, we're getting ahead of ourselves in the story here. That's in Genesis. <laughs> oh yeah. Spoiler alert. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's but next, that's next week's how section. How many years have you had to read this? Book? <laughs> right, right. So, but the here's the years and years ago we we're doing some training for counseling learning how to counsel folks and all that. And I'll, this was really good. We were talking about how everybody functions out of the flesh, which is, which is bad and evil. But they use these terms. Some people have what we call, what they call positively programmed flesh, and some people have negatively programmed flesh. What they meant by that both? was... <laughs> prob- yeah, for sure. But I mean, but I think I definitely most got people both. T- tend toward one way or another. Positively negative programmed flesh refers to sins that are obvious, drunkenness, revelry, Mm -hmm. anger, immorality, all these sins that to us are obvious. Oh, you know, we talk about people, oh, he's going straight to hell or or whatever. You know, things like that where we think, oh, those are horrific, that's bad. Which is so untrue. Yeah. So, or positively Only not accepting Jesus sends you to hell. Right. (laughs) Positively programmed flesh is... Your outstanding member of the community who has secret sins and whose sins are of the heart. Yeah. He doesn't do the bad things out there, but in his heart there's evil and wickedness and all this mm-hmm. that's that's that, so we call they would they would use the term positively programmed flesh. You this guy may be harder to convert than this guy over here, because this guy knows he's messed up. This guy thinks he's got it all together. Right. But he's just as messed up as this person, according to the ethics of Jesus, where it's the heart issues were all lost. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, in this narrative here in Genesis 21 through 30, we see mostly, it's pretty obvious these guys are, they got issues. But the people who don't have, appear to have issues, they got issues also. Oh, yeah. So we're, oh, we're, yeah. we're all lost and needing a savior. But. Yeah, we all have a big problem of comparing ourselves to others, or yeah. at least comparing ourselves to the perception we have of others. 
Right. You see somebody else, and that's what I think a lot of social media and stuff might contribute to depression because all you see is what they want you to see, and it's the best part of their life, and you're comparing the best part of someone's life to what your you know real yourself. your reality. Right. You're like, man, my life must be terrible. And there's this phrase that's popped up, and I just noticed it in the past year. So, virtual virtual signaling. Virtue signaling. Virtue. Thank you. Virtue signaling. Where people are posting things to look good in front of others on social media. Yeah. And I think that's really no true. substance to it. Who, just who among us doesn't do that? Yeah. Really, we're wanting to look good. We project a, a, a thing of ourselves, and that that was long before social media, though. Exactly. What you're saying is virtue signaling right now is just a social media, but we all do a version of that in our own life. Sure. Yeah, that's what you mean. And it's in some ways it's natural. No, nobody wants to lead out with. Here's my junk. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. We don't do that. <laughs> Let's keep that in. Yeah. Hey, my name is Rick. I'm a terrible person every single way. Um, I was just thinking about murdering someone yesterday. And <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Right, right. You repented. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but we all need a savior. This, this takes me to the passage I was wanting to bring to the table, which is um, Genesis 22 with Abraham. We, we won't spend long on it, but God calling him to sacrifice Isaac. Yeah. Crazy. How old was he when he had Isaac? I don't recall. I think, I think no. he was like 100 years Pretty old. Pretty old, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think he was 100 yeah, he years was old. Sarah was way past childbirth. Yeah, she was She 90. was 90. Yeah, 90. Oh, he had right. to wait there you 100 go. years. She laughed when she heard she was going to be pregnant, as we talked That's about. Right. That's right. Chase brought that story last week. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when we get to this issue of are we good? No, we're not. But, man, Abraham, with all his weaknesses and stuff, he obeyed God and was willing to go put his son on the altar. The book of Hebrews gives us insight yes. onto this and says the reason why he put his son on the altar and pulled that knife up and was ready to kill him was because he believed that God would raise him from the dead. Yes. He did not think God was going to stop him. No. He, he thought, I'm going to kill my son, but I know, Lord, you promised that this son is going to be you know, my descendant. He's going to have, you know, I'm going to have enough children as stars in the sky, and you're going to bring him back. Yeah. And correct me if I'm wrong, but no one had been resurrected up to that point in human history. Yeah. Talk about be yeah, first. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there, there was, yeah, there's no category for that. And yet he was like, this, that's the only way I can think of this is going to work. But he believed God at that point. Yeah. God, God, if, if he's telling me to kill him, that, that mean, must mean he's going to bring him back to life. Wow. Yep. That's, a, that's amazing faith. Mm -hmm. that's, Things that, like that don't make sense to us in our today's culture. Can you imagine something like that was happening? Mm -hmm. People would think Abraham's a horrible person. Yes. I, I mean, yeah. And after, actually, he was doing God's will. Yeah. yeah. What was Isaac thinking when he saw that knife go up? <laughs> uh, a part of me thinks maybe his, he wasn't looking. He's like, Dad, what you doing? I remember what's going, going on? Yeah, now? Where's, going up where's the, the sacrificial lamb at here? Right, that's what I'm saying. When they're going up the mountain, he's like, Dad, I, we've got the wood, we've got the... Where's the sacrifice? Yeah. Right? Well, God, pro God will provide. Well, that, yeah. That was that's what I said. Yeah, well, I guess I was going to say, did Abraham lie when he said that? He's like, no, God will provide you. <laughs> <laughs> right. But he didn't, you know? God, Right. and, and, and I, I think you were going to, well, I, I don't want to steal your thunder. Uh, no, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, that is a perfect picture of what happened on the cross. Yes. I don't need to be Isaac being sacrificed. Mm -hmm. For the law that God has demanded of me, in, instead, at the last minute, he takes me away from the cross, which should have been my, my punishment, my due punishment, mm -hmm. and he replaces it with the ram that was stuck. But in this case, it wasn't the ram, it's he, Jesus, his own son. Yes. He sacrificed him, his own son on the cross so that justice could be done, because God is a God of justice, yeah. but mercy could be done. And that I don't have to pay for my sins, he does yes, on my grace. behalf. And he did it for the joy that was set before him. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that Jesus was fighting God the Father the whole time. It was preordained within the Trinity that this was always going to be what was going to bring God the most glory and bring us the most joy Yes, in finding our salvation and our, uh, uh, our newness of life in Christ on the cross. So... God, there's, there's so many applications out of this story, mm -hmm. one, of, one of which, and that's beautifully said, Rick, one of which is God, out of that story, we need to be all, what do we love most on this earth that is not the Lord himself, and are we willing to give that up? So it's a test of our, and he was testing, it says that he was testing him, so that's, that is good. that's a test for us, 
because here's the thing. This shows that we're all sinners. I think we all have things before God in our lives. Mm-hmm. All of us have things we love more than God in this life. And, and any time we love God, it's in response to him loving us, and we are loving him so imperfectly while he's loving us perfectly. Mm-hmm. But the greatest, the greatest application of this story is what you just said. We don't have to... We don't have to kill our son. Jesus, God killed his son for us, so we could be forgiven. Mm-hmm. It's, it's an incredible story. At the end. And then some even think that the place where Abraham, the mountain he went up, was actually Mount Calvary. Some right. people think this was literally the place where How Christ poetic, was crucified right? you know, uh, on the cross. Whether or not that's true, right. we don't know for sure, but um, that's interesting to think about. So, All right, good stuff. Hey. Really enjoyed it. We're going to head to the break and come back and talk to you. Well. We want you to know that you can watch Small Town Big Deal every week. There's fierce competitions, daredevils, unusual traditions, and some wacky contests. <laughs> you never know what we'll find next. Small Town Big Deal is our love letter to America, and there's a lot to love. Go to SmalltownBigDeal.com to see when and where you can watch us in your hometown. Don't miss the fun. Tune in every week. All right. It's great to have you on the show, Rodney. (laughs) And we wanted to just have you share a little bit about your wonderful TV show, the hit program, Small Town Big Deal with No Comma. You have no comma after Small Town. Small Town Big Deal. (laughs) A lot of people make that mistake. Yeah. Before we talk about the show, though, I'd like for you to just share briefly your your testimony, how you came to faith in Christ, raised in a Christian home, et cetera. Yeah, I was raised in a very traditional Christian home in a, in a very rural community in southern Illinois. I mean, I was raised on a farm, but near a small community. And um, But yeah, parents, very devout Christians. Um, I would still say my dad is maybe one of the best Christians I've ever met in my life, and I lived with him, so you know, you find out how people really are then. Mm-hmm. And um, my mom the same way, and uh, you know, we were... I had a I had a drug problem as a young child because I got drugged to church every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, and every Wednesday night, you know. And then Thursday night, you know what was on Thursday night? No. Come on, you guys aren't as old as I. That was Thursday night visitation. Oh, that's when Thursday you went visiting visitation. people. Yeah. Mm. So uh, you know, see, you guys aren't even. Uh, you know, I know you're not even got. You didn't have as bad a drug problem as I did. <laughs> so um, yeah, we went a small country church. Um, you know. Back with the had the boards up there, and we had like thirty. Is that 35. church still going? It still is going. Yeah, which which is it? Still City Missionary Baptist Church. Okay, yeah, Southern Baptist, but they call it, some Southern Baptists call themselves Missionary Baptist churches. Then, but right, not that okay. it matters what religion it was. I mean, we were we were Christians, right? You know, so right. I don't try not to get too tied up in religions, but you know, I just believe denominations and are, flavors. Yeah. That's what I call them. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, it's Which about a relationship tribe. with yeah. Christ. It's not right. about religion. So, Amen. so, uh, you can be Catholic or anything. And, and, or, and as long as you have a relationship that you can be Southern Baptist and be lost as can be. So that's right. <laughs> right. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, I grew up in that great home. I mean, you know, people talk about their childhood and, you know, they want to forget this. I, I mean, I, I want to remember everything about my childhood. It was that good. So, right. you know, growing up a far, on a farm, I, I love farming. I love the taking care of animals and raising corn and crops and working on fences and, you know, all that stuff that really taught me to work. And, uh, and then, you know, I had made a profession of faith when I was like in, in first grade. I went forward in Bible school because everybody else was, you know, mm-hmm. going forward. And um, but I didn't get saved, and I knew it. Right. I said I did, but I knew I didn't get saved. So I was not fooling myself, even though I was trying to fool everybody else. And so this went on then. And, you know, so going, you knew at this point you weren't saved. Oh, I knew. I, okay, there was no just, doubt in my mind. That's what I need to do. It was the social yeah. pressure yeah, at the time. It was social yeah. pressure, and uh, so then you know. Um, was constantly, you know, back, this is in the 60s and early 70s, and you guys are younger than me, but that's when a lot of uh, uh, fire and brimstone preaching was happening. Mm -hmm. You don't hear that much anymore, Uh, but it was back then, and it was a scary time. You know, going to church was scary for me because I was reminded constantly, and then when I laid down at night, you know, I knew I was afraid I was going to die and go to hell, and and, um, this went on, and I had stomach problems, um, Later, in, when I was in first and second and third grade. But anyway, I, I didn't get saved until just before my 16th birthday. And, and on, on, on Labor Day of 1972, that on the Sunday night after, before Labor Day, I guess, the Sunday night before Labor Day, so September 2nd, 1972. But 
we were talking at home and uh, uh, my sister was her de- her husband's a preacher and she'd said how they'd made the wrong uh, move going to seminary and how it caused them some issues just because of other things and and she was crying and everything and and I remember looking at my dad and said you know dad I don't know if I'm a Christian which which was a lie because I knew I was lost as could be but right and so we kneeled down and he you know I asked God to come into my life and there was no no doubt about it. you know I was always looking that it was going to be I wanted this great experience I wanted to jump the pews or 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 have this great awakening right. but it's not like that you know it's it's just you ask and he forgives and that's it, yeah. all there is to it and and I finally understood that I didn't really understand how to be saved maybe until maybe a month or two before I actually got saved mm. so uh funny you go to church all that time and you never really get it yeah yeah the and, eyes have to be open. and being in a household, yeah. Be, yeah, where we're praying before every meal, and my father is, you know, being the great dad and and yeah. Christian leader that he was, and yeah, so it's funny, yeah, you know, uh, I, I I admire people who hear it the first time and get saved because mm-hmm. they got a lot better understanding. Of that. I'm pretty hard headed, I guess, and and not very smart, but yeah. but thank God he didn't give up on me, and and uh, so you know I've never doubted it since that day. I've um. I know what happened right then, and mm-hmm. and uh, very grateful. And I've you know been a horrible Christian most of my life since then. But but uh, God's a forgiving God, and mm-hmm. and um, thank goodness for that. Amen. 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 So, were you baptized the first time? I was, and then baptized again after that. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Similar to to me. Um, mm-hmm. Although I still don't know to this day whether I was truly saved at ten years old or right before my sixteenth birthday. Probably was right before my sixteenth birthday. I think now, but. Um, yeah, wow, okay. I didn't yeah. realize that was your story. I thought you became a Christian as a child. So I'm glad, glad you yeah, shared that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's interesting, too. I mean, I, mean I, I don't know if this is a comfort to those at home, but to, to think that you were living, you, you know, you professed faith at first grade, and then it was, what, all the way till high school, and then, you, you know, you finally got saved. There's a whole, you lived your whole life. Kind of, you know, everybody thinking that you had done it back then, but you knew, like, you still need to wrestle with the Lord about this, and yeah. the Lord won. <laughs> Thank God. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> amen. <laughs> wow. Okay. Cool. It's funny that you talk that you bring you talk about the fire and brimstone um, preaching uh, because I think you're right. There's not there's not, not much, much of that. that today. But the Lord. It's used... all about love. But you know, there's a whole other side to God. Yeah. It, it, for those <laughs> who have who would remember the. When I was sharing my testimony, that's exactly what the Lord used for me. It was a, a very old-fashioned, fire and brimstone, open-air preacher, which the Lord used to make me, I lay my head down at, at night, and like, if any part of what he just said is true, I'm in trouble. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think we might need to return to some of that. Yeah. Well, I it's, mean, it's the full gospel. our people, because everyone is just like, God's love, he'll forgive me. Yeah. No repentance needed anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't even have to affiliate with Christ anymore in a lot of people's minds. Yeah. You know, hey, well, he's a forgiving God. He'll forgive. That's that's what Jesus was about. So yeah. it doesn't people matter don't if fear I follow God. him or not. Right. And and, and, and the Bible the commands beginning. us many yeah. times to fear God. That's and, the and beginning that's of when, wisdom. Yeah. When they start reading and they're like, why is the Bible telling me to fear God? Yeah. What, what is that doesn't and it doesn't make sense in their brain. It's like, well, but that's biblical. Like, so for those who do believe there is a Satan, that they think we're supposed to fear him. And Jesus says, don't fear him. Exactly. Yeah, don't fear him who can fear. take your life. Fear him who can take your soul. Right. right. And that's God alone. That's right. So, wow, it's good. Good. Uh, what? So you you grow up in this Christian home. Mm-hmm. You meet Kendra in high school. Um, actually, after high school and college. Okay, in college. I was. Yeah. 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 And you guys have been married forty two years. Yep. She lived only a mile and a half from me, but I she went to a different school than me. She was from the country too, and. And so we met. She on went a to blind Thompsonville, and you went to yeah. Benton. Yeah, uh, yep. And so I, we met on a blind date. Oh wow! Oh cool. My yeah. dad met my mom on a blind date as well. <laughs> Those things can work out pretty good. Yeah. Now you go into. You eventually end up in the tractor industry. Yeah. And serve as an uh, uh, executive in the tractor industry. You leave that and pursue this dream. Yeah. 
of a TV show. So I always say I was born a, born a farmer and I hope to die a farmer. And if I die today, yeah, that, well, I will have succeeded. So that's probably my first passion is farming and, and the love of farming. But I also did other – I always had a full-time work somewhere else also. And I was in construction early in my life. And I was a basketball coach as well as in construction. I was actually coach of the year in junior high in 1984 in Illinois. Um, and then um, then I got into the tractor industry and in, in, uh, I got I, – I, I, I had someone who who wouldn't pay me about a quarter of a million dollars or so can collectively, uh, and it caused me to lose my construction company, which was the best thing that ever happened to me, seriously. Mm. And uh, I probably would still be fighting that today if it wasn't. And it sent my life in a whole different direction. And I got into the tractor industry, and um, with God's blessing, had some success, and 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 eventually became from a territory manager became the CEO of. For JB Hunt, uh, in a new company that we took from two million in annual sales to eighty million in annual sales in wow. just three years, and then became CEO. Of, that was Montana Tractors. That was company. Montana Tractors, and then JB Hunt's the the trucker. Yes, the truck largest trucking company in the world. He was worth three and a half billion dollars. He taught me so much. He's the only guy I ever met that got up at three thirty in the morning and prayed and read his Bible for two hours. I I don't know many other people. Actually, I know no other people who right. do that. Right, but. Um, uh, he was just a great guy. Taught me so much. He was in my office every day for three and a half years until he died. And and um, but just an awesome guy, awesome Christian. Um, somebody I have a tremendous amount of respect for. Both, you know, he he only had a sixth grade education. He he always joked it. Uh, just think how rich I'd have been if I had left after the fourth grade. <laughs> and uh, you know, <laughs> he had a great set. He had a, he was a simple kind of guy, even though he was a billionaire. That, that he liked to tell the difference between a millionaire and a billionaire. And it's really simple if you think about it. If you made a dollar a second, you'd be a millionaire in 11 days. It'd take you 35 years to be a billionaire. There's a big wow. difference between yeah. millionaires and billionaires. But so I was very fortunate. He gave me my first chance. He believed in me and, and made me CEO, and it worked out good for him too. And, and um, then he died. Um, so his death was unexpected. Slipped on the ice and, and, and hit his head on December 7th of 2006 and died three days later. Really never gained consciousness. And mm -hmm. that, was, he was, that was a big blow to you, too. That was a big blow. I mean, he was 81. Um, it turned my life upside down. It sent me on a totally different trajectory. Um, and then through a serendipity thing, three months later, I left the company and became CEO of McCormick Tractors. McCormick International, which I thought was my dream job, I was, their North American headquarters was in... Atlanta. I moved to Atlanta. It was a nightmare from the get-go. Um, it was where everything was perfect in Arkansas when I was with JB, and everything's just seen, you know, God, everything fell into place. Well, I still think it was God's will for us to go there, but it sure wasn't fun. And I remember before my family got there, it was there a wilderness time, experience. It was a wilderness in terms experience of your career, for me. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I had a lot of success there, but. Then I found out about fraud that the owners in Italy were, were committing, and um, I was faced with a very, very, very wow. tough decision to either sign an audit that I would have been committing um, uh, uh, a felony, right? and I chose not to, and I got fired, and it cost me to, um, a very high-paying job. Well, all that was serendipity, too. There's a lot to that story that I don't want to get into right now, but, but um, then um, I had this dream to start this TV show. And I had that for quite a while before this. I actually started back at Montana Tractors. And uh, when I I was a really shy kid growing up, and uh, people don't believe that today. But there's this picture of me of all the family, and I'm on the front row, and I'm a little kid, and I'm like this. I didn't even <laughs> want to look at a camera. Uh -huh. So I'm very different today. I think a lot of things changed that. But um had this dream to start this show, and, and we shot a pie. When we moved to Atlanta, my best friend there is now my um, um, executive producer. And I told him about this dream I had to start this TV show about the real America, I called it at the time. And when you say dream, because a lot of Christians, God speaks to them through dreams. And a lot of times they get dreams that then they pursue. It wasn't a literal night, night dream. You're talking about dream in the sense of the word that we often use it. This was something you desired to do. Yeah, you dreamed about doing. I just kind of had a vision. Yeah, as I'm an entrepreneur, I've started a lot of companies in my life, and um, and I I wanted to do this, and I do nothing about it. You right. know, I've never been on TV, but but when when the when I was at really how it started was when I was, was CEO at Montana, the marketing company that we had that did our national advertising, they thought I would be good on the national commercials to represent the company, and I'm going. 
I'm a real shy guy. I, I'm not going to, you know, I'll be terrible. And they just insisted. And after a few months, I, I agreed to try to do a commercial for mm-hmm. them. Mm-hmm. And it's funny, other, I've heard other people on TV say this same thing. Even though I was a very shy person, um, when I got in front of the camera, it's like I had a relationship with the camera, and I mm-hmm. loved it from the very first second. Right. Wow. And, and uh, it's strange, I know, but it, it, it is very different. And, and so I had this dream. So then it started, hey, I'd like to do this more. So uh, then I just... But I didn't know anything about it, so it just went on for several years. And then when I met him, I told him about it, and he 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 was in the TV industry. So he said, "Hey, let's get. I got know these guys. Let's get together. We shot this a pilot. This is Roger. Roger over in Atlanta a, now. Yeah, yeah, over a period of time, we shot a pilot, like over a year or two. I had a different host co-host at that time. It worked out that we couldn't work everything out together, and uh, a marketing firm in St. Louis who really helped him. My my best friend, uh, one of my very best friends in life, Mike Turley, is was the CEO there of Osborne Bar, which is the largest ag marketing firm in America. They really got behind it, and he said, you know, really you need a female co-host, and he did all this other stuff, and we made these changes. We shot another pilot, um, and we got a network to want us, and we got on the air in RFD on September 6, 2012. And, and, uh, and RFD stands for Rule... Rule of free delivery. You know, you have to you have to be as old as me to really know what that means. But it's a rural network that right. kind of focuses on rural America. Um, and so we were on there, and we did very well. We're still on there today. We're still on that network. But then our big break is we went into syndication in 2015, and we were on 85 stations at first, and now we're on 286 stations across America, and it grows every week just about. But, but um, That's amazing. So we're all over America. We're on ABC in New York, ABC in Chicago, Philadelphia, CBS in Los Angeles. Uh, ABC in Atlanta, you know, just to name a few, and 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 we've had good ratings. We're one of the highest rated uh, syndicated shows on TV in the top. I say highest rated in the top one hundred. Mm-hmm. And um, how so, many shows are in syndication? So we've we have about a hundred and forty. Oh, how many shows are in syndication? Oh, probably thousands. I'm yeah. not sure. Yeah. Uh, definitely hundreds. Yeah, there's several thousand shows on TV. Uh, I, I just heard that number last week, but I can't remember exactly. There's so many channels now. This isn't oh, the, yeah. the TV we grew up with at the three, yeah. three stations and yeah. BBS. Yeah, that's what I grew up with. Right. So it's really changed, but yeah. And so um, that's kind of how. Yeah. Then when we went into syndication, we started getting national acclaim. But really, I, I need to jump way back and, so, and talk about After a critical one. motive. Right. Is that when we debuted on RFD TV on on September 6, two thousand twelve, something big happened, and my co-host now who is Jan Carl, who was on Entertainment Tonight for 14 years and really a star in Hollywood, um, heard about the show and reached out to us and said, it's the show I've always wanted to do. Would you consider working with me? And I'm like, you want to work with me? Right. I mean, you know, I'm nobody. You're a big star. You when can you do got whatever. the email from her initially, it, you thought it was a joke. Yes, I did. A it prank came, somebody was pulling it, on it you. It came to our executive producer, and he almost didn't even forward it to me because he thought it was a joke. Mm-hmm. And because she called me her hero in there, I don't ever let her forget that. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> have it framed. And then, uh, um, then she went on and told a little bit about it and gave me her cell phone number and then her lat her she ended with i'm not a stalker <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great so we talked over a couple of months wrote these long emails back and forth trying to get to know each other and then i said hey we need to we need to meet so we met in Los Angeles. i went out there and met with her in pasadena where she lived and and um we spent two days together pretty much talking through this and we kind of came to an agreement and i said okay come to atlanta if if everything goes well with my team then we got a deal and she always says I made her do a screen test, but that's not true. I just wanted to see how we looked on camera together because she's obviously this gorgeous blonde, and and, mm-hmm. I, and I'm uh, I didn't want to look like Mutt and Jeff or something, you know. But it turns out we kind of look like uh, the uh, the guy the guy and the girl next door. So so uh, and we have this great chemistry on camera, which has really mm-hmm. made the show. Um, mm-hmm. You know, you can have a show about anything if the characters are good enough, and. Right. Um, I guess we just good characters. I don't know. But together we have this chemistry. Where we're constantly joking with each other, kind of mm-hmm. like we were doing earlier. Yep. And and we just kind of we we I know what she's going to say before she says it, you know, and I mean we she's talking over me and I'm talking over her. And and that makes good TV, you know, it's not right. it's not scripted. And right. um and then we go all over America and tell these great stories. We've actually filmed in 44 states so far. Mm-hmm. So we want to do all 50 and then in a lot of states we've done many many times. Yeah. We've shot over 300 segments in our in them nine years almost that we've been filming now so mm-hmm. 
It's been a journey. It ain't been easy because we own the show along with some investors. That means we got to make payroll every week and we got to do all this stuff. And it's really challenging. I've, it's taking all of my business expertise in God's hand for us to get through this. Um, really, I should just say his hand. You know, I, I'm always reminded of Psalms uh, 127.1 that except God build the house, you labor in vain. Yep. And, and boy, is that ever true. And, and most of the time, I'm trying to build it on my own. You know, <laughs> yeah, it's the constant struggle. Yeah, <laughs> and um, so that's that's been the challenge uh, for us. But we've made it this far, and nine years in TV is an eternity. You know, for us mm-hmm. to have survived this long, and yeah, uh, you know, when we, when you look at that Nielsen list, when sometimes we show up in the mid '60s or the '70s, every show above us is owned by Warner Brothers or Sony or CBS syndication or all of that, and every show behind us for the next hundred or so is also owned by all wow. those. Big, and then there's little. Small town, big deal. Owned by small town, big deal. <laughs> so you're the yeah. David amidst the Goliaths of the, right. of the really TV industry. Been. We, as somebody in the industry said, we've cr- created a unicorn because they don't even know what to do with us. Nobody does what we did. Right. Wow. What we've done. People write us all the time. You have the best jobs in the world. Well, we do have a great job, but there's also another side to it that's really challenging, and that sure. is keeping it all together. Mm-hmm. So, going back to the the vision, the dream. I remember one time you you mentioned to me that. Part of this came from the downgrading of television over time. You you were wanting something positive. Yeah, a- absolutely. I wanted to show. This goes all, back to your Christian. That's right. I wanted to show all the good that was happening in America. You know, yeah. all, if you turn on the news, it's all the bad. You know, back when I was a kid, they used to have the segment on Friday night every time, and Jan talks about this all the time that she wanted to be Charles Corral. You guys yeah. are a little young for that, baby. But I remember but Charles Corral yeah. had this positive thing after after you heard everything about the Vietnam War back in the day. Then the last thing was about something good happening in America, and that's what our whole show is about. Right. It's about the good things happening in America, which there are a lot of them. And uh, right. and we go everywhere, and and I, I and then something, you know, I'm maybe stealing your thunder on something, but it, you know, we always had a ministry kind of thing in mind. We're not a ministry, right? Most of everybody who works on our show are Christian or have a strong faith uh, in in um, s- something. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, um, I don't want to downplay anybody else's religions, but but so we're all very concerned about it, ha- what everything. I mean, we are family friendly, and I am very proud of that. We have the Parent Television Council's seal of approval. That is really hard to get. Mm-hmm. We're one of the few shows on TV that have it. So it's very important to us that you can sit down with your five-year-old or your three-year-old and, and right. not have to worry about anything you see on our show. I mean, we're very careful about, I mean, very careful about, we have to edit a lot of stuff out that looks funny, but it wouldn't come across right. Right, and yeah. We're not that kind of show, so we've held true to that. Yeah, that's really good. And I really appreciate that because it is hard to find, increasingly hard through the years and through the decades, mm-hmm. to find family-friendly programming. Yeah, where yeah. you can just sit there and watch it, and not have to worry about covering your kids' ears or eyes. You know, and and it's funny. Just the last week, we were sitting there with the show, and it's sometimes it's not even the show; it's the commercial. And I have to be like, "No, you didn't see that, right. in that yeah. commercial." But it, I was I was watching some, a few episodes of your show, and it gets me excited about going to go see small towns. Well, good, right? <laughs> well, because I mean, everything I would say, everything else is like it, it, it seems like all the news always goes to the big cities. And you forget that there are small towns, and if you did, like, it, you get this idea, like, it's just one stoplight that you're driving to another big city for. But there's yeah. a whole, there's lives and communities and things that you should go see. I, it was, it was really. You've fun. really highlighted a lot of flyover America. Oh, very much. And people write us all the time, say we're they're planning their vacations off places we've been and and that type of thing, and it makes. I us was feel thinking weird. that. And we get a lot. We actually get a ton of emails every week from people across America. And, thanking us for doing the show. Jan always says that was a, you know, and, and I should say this too, when, when Jan came on the show, it, it gave us instant credibility. You know, I was just mm-hmm. this nobody. I was this little farm boy from Southern Illinois, but, you know, she was a big star and it made everybody think, well, this may be something here, mm-hmm. you know, if she thinks it's that good and, and, and that type of thing. So I can't, I mean, we would not be where we are today had she not come on the show. There's no doubt about it. But but uh, and she's made me a lot better on camera, and she's made our production so much better. And she's such a she has a creative mind. But yeah, we we get these letters, and even even seriously, a letter from a, a young girl in California who was going to commit suicide and watched our show and told us how it changed her life. And wow, uh, oh, wow. So I mean, we've had all kinds of of, of emails like that that. 
you know, make us think we're done. And, you know, then we were able to move into some other things. So one of the things I really appreciated was your Christmas specials each year. I don't know of any other program, which, like you say, you're, it's, you're, you, this isn't Christian TV. No. This is, and we're mainstream. This mm-hmm. is excellent, family-friendly television done by from a Christian perspective, yeah. from someone who created the show and co-hosted, you're, 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 like you say, most of you guys are Christians wanting to present something showing the good in America. And then once a year on your Christmas special, you have someone explain the true meaning of Christmas. And I don't know, aside from the growing up watching the uh, Peanuts. Yes, I was going to say the Charlie Brown. The Charlie Brown yeah. thing. That was I don't great. know of any other chance. Where, where else do you get this on mainstream television, the true meaning of Christmas? Because everyone avoids it like crazy. Mm-hmm. How has that been received, and have you had any stations or anybody buck that? Yeah, you know, and we haven't. That's the, that's the funny thing is we – so our show is cleared on 276 shows every week, stations every week, but we're cleared on about 320 for our Christmas special. So even more stations clear our Christmas special. We have never heard one negative comment from any of our – stations not one wow and to the contrary most stations air at multiple times as an example last year abc in new york ran our christmas special three times in new york city in new york city and every time it either was number one or number two in the market the last time it was on a sunday afternoon they aired it and that we went up against a big local game i can't remember if it was georgetown and syracuse or whoever but they did beat us in the ratings, but we, we beat every other station, and we had more viewers than all the other stations combined. So, I, and, I'm, and talking about Jesus, and he, God yeah, sent Jesus yeah, to this earth to yeah. provide salvation. That so, was talked about on your Christmas special. We always close it with that. We go mm-hmm. around America and, and, and show how America celebrates Christmas, and then mm-hmm. we close it with the real meaning of Christmas. John Maxwell did it the first year. Johnny Erickson tied it, did yes. it two years in a row. But then this year, um, Stephen had Kirsch, Albert Pujols on there. We've had Albert Pujols. He did a great job giving his testimony on there. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, and then Stephen Curtis Chapman did it this year, and I thought he did a great job. And, yeah. And um, so that's how, you know how that started was I had this vision then to start this uh, Christmas special, a one hour Christmas special that we heard there was a need for Christmas specials. And I, I told your program's that, thirty minutes long. Our th- program's thirty minutes long each week. So. I told our team, I said, you know, maybe God's given us all this success on our weekly show just so we can do this Christmas special. And they'll let you get by with a lot more on a Christmas special than they will on your weekly show because it's Christmas. And um, and our philosophy is we don't try to in your face. It, we always say if it was a Hanukkah special, we'd, we'd tell the real Hanukkah, you right, know, but it's right. a Christmas special. So we're telling the real Christmas. And mm-hmm. uh, so we always want to tell, um, we have three three points that I insist get come, is that Jesus just didn't come to to, to as, a, as a baby. He also came to live his life mm-hmm. and then to, to die on the cross for to complete the plan of salvation. And it's important that we cover all of those. Yes. Not just that, hey, the, he came as baby Jesus and it's love, love, love. It's, 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 there's a lot more to it than that. Mm-hmm. Right. And so we make sure those points are covered on each one of them. And, and so I think our, our producers and, and editors and our crew have done a great job of doing that. Yeah, I, th- I certainly think so. so. So how can how can people find out more about Small Town Big Deal? Yeah, you can go to our website at smalltownbigdeal.com, and um, you can even through there you can link to our um, uh, YouTube channel. You can if you don't, but we're on two hundred seventy. We're on, we're almost probably on a station you can get uh, over the air station. Mm-hmm. We're also on With rabbit ears. Yeah, yeah, we're on Dish. Right. We're on Direct TV. We're on AT and T. You know, we're on just uh, there's a ton of ways you can watch us. And um, so, no matter if you've cut the cable or not, you, you can find us. Even on YouTube, you have episodes. We have that a are YouTube, YouTube channel, mm-hmm. uh, and just about all of our episodes are on there. We have 140 some episodes, I think, but mm-hmm. but most of them are there, and um, and that's uh, getting more and more popular. People watching on YouTube, you know, it's commercial free then, but mm-hmm. but um, uh, so yeah, great. Well, Ronnie, it's been great to have you on the show. Really appreciate your friendship and, and what you're doing with this, you and Jan are doing with the show and, and everybody involved in the show. And so uh, 
Check out Small Town Big Deal if you've not watched it. I guarantee you it is a great show to watch. And now you know a little bit about the creator and co-host, and that might motivate you to uh, become a Small Town Big Deal fan like our family is. Mm -hmm. So go check them out, smalltownbigdeal.com. 